I'm going to just share a little uh, kind of a humorous anecdote here. No, not an anecdote story. So Karen and I are not very good gardeners, but we do have a bunch of uh, potted tomatoes, and um, two of them needed to be transplanted. So I was uh, took the one out, put it in a bigger pot. It was fine. And then I was taking the other one out, and as I was taking it out, it, the stem just it just collapsed on the stem. And I was like, ugh. And so, uh, and it was the cherry tomatoes, which we really, really love. So I, I, I took it, and I, I propped it up, and I put duct tape around it, good redneck engineering, put cage around it, prayed over it. So guess which plant is now completely dead? The one I never prayed over. I just assumed it was okay. The other one that fell over, literally, the stem just collapsed. It's fine. <laughs> So, never underestimate the power of prayer. Amen. Lord, we thank you that you, Lord, we say, you are the God who hears. You are the God who hears. You invite us to come into your presence, to give us, uh, give us your, our prayers and petitions, our supplications to you. We thank you for such a grace, such an honor, that your very throne room is open to your saints. We bless your holy name. <laughs> One of the ironies we have talked about is how John simultaneously downplays the importance of miracles while at the same time insisting they offer authoritative proof concerning all of the claims of Jesus. And he concludes his narrative noting that had all the... Now we have one of the Gospels, and that's in, in Luke. In John's Gospel here, though, it's where we learn that they have a brother, Lazarus. And it's only from John's gospel we learn of his resurrection on the other gospels recorded. And we learn some other th things from John as well. We learn this was a wealthy family. The, the expected practice of the day was that if somebody died in your family, you were to hire at least two professional mourners. Yes, you, you heard that correctly. They would hire people to come and cry and wail. Professional mourners uh, uh, that would come for a period of, of at least four days, sometimes seven or more. And the more mourners at a funeral, the greater the status of the person who died. And the fact that we read in verses 13, 19, 31, and 36 that there were numerous Jews consoling the sisters shows that they had means to provide plenty of professional mourners. Moreover, we're also told that Jews had come from Jerusalem showing this was a, a well-connected family with influence far beyond this tiny town of Bethany. Uh, the mention of anointing by Mary here, it's a future reference that we're going to read all about in chapter 12 and shouldn't be confused with the anointing of Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. Uh, in that one, in Mark, Matthew and Mark, we read of how an anonymous woman had poured expensive perfume on Jesus' feet at the house of a Pharisee that Jesus was visiting. And Mary certainly wasn't anonymous. She was well known uh, by Jesus as well as the rest of the disciples. This is a house they've come to as they've been trapped during their travels when they come to Jerusalem. And Mary will anoint Jesus in her own home, not that of a Pharisee. In both Matthew and Mark, we read of how yet another woman anointed Jesus' head with a similarly expensive perfume, just as at the other two times was done with expensive perfume. In this last case, it's the head of Jesus, which is anointed and not his feet. In both of those Gospels, it is made clear that the last anointing took place at the house of Simon the leper, after Jesus' triumphal entry, uh, but before the Last Supper. And, and the anointing of Jesus in John's Gospel chronologically takes place between these other two. In John's Gospel, he's in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and the timing is specified as several weeks prior to the triumphal entry and before Jesus returns to Jerusalem for the last Passover celebration. At this time, just as at the first time, it is his feet that are anointed, not his head, as will happen in a few short weeks. Now, some people get upset 
with the three descriptions, thinking that they're too similar not to describe one event, despite their explicitly different details that also come along with them. But I would just ask, why do we need to come to such a conclusion? Why can we not accept that God chose to ordain three separate anointings? Three, like seven, is a divine num number, which has obvious and significant connections to the Lord. Three is the number of persons in the Godhead. Three is the number of times we are told Jesus prayed on the night of his betrayal. And three is the number of days in the tomb. How do we suppose that three accounts, all using very expensive perfume, would be out of line or somehow incongruent with God making a beautiful statement as to the value and import of his son and his sacrifice? Why would we suppose that God could not have provided three different women with one means of intimately expressing their worship to the God they loved? An expression of worship so beautiful and so profound, it's one we should all strive to emulate. Three anointings fit very well into the message of the cross. So just to recap, we had three different anointings at three different times at three different houses. And John goes out of his way to mention Mary's anointing here before it happened because it becomes part of his commentary in chapter 12 of how Jesus will interact, or his commentary now about how Jesus will interact with both the sisters of Lazarus when he comes to visit them in six days. And that's six days counting from the day when Jesus first receives the news of Lazarus' death or illness. And regarding the six days and the overall timing events, a little math will help us clarify how, how this comes together. When Jesus first receives the news of Lazarus' illness, we understand him still to be alive. When Jesus comments that Lazarus has an illness, which will lead to death, he is speaking in the present tense, which perhaps makes it all the more curious for Jesus to delay his departure two more days, and we're going to comment on that in just a minute. At the end of those two days, using, we presume, his divine knowledge, which we've seen him do many times, Jesus then plainly states that Lazarus has died. And only at that point does Jesus begin the journey to Martha and Mary's village. We are told he arrived on the fourth day after Lazarus has died and been buried. Since Jesus was four days' journey from their home, his remaining two extra days when he was across the Jordan didn't contribute to Lazarus' death, don't uh, count in, in, in Lazarus' death. Even had he left immediately upon hearing the news of the illness, he still would have been a two-day journey from Bethany by the, by the day he reported Lazarus had died. So if we add the two days he weighed it, plus the four days he took to get to the tomb, we have a total of six days. That's where we get six days. But even if he had left immediately upon receiving the news, we may conclude he still would have arrived two days after Lazarus' death, instead of four days after, as reported when he did arrive. So the two days he waited were two days Lazarus was still alive, and the four days he took to travel to the tomb were four days after Lazarus has died, and that's when he arrives on the scene. The reason he delayed, it was good for him not to be there any sooner. The good reason we are specifically told in verse 5 was this. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and because he loved them, it was for that reason he stayed another two days. And while at first thought that may seem peculiar, as we will see, it's going to give Jesus a basis to perform an even greater miracle than just the healing. Jesus has already cured innumerable people from sickness, and no doubt some of those people healed had been on their deathbeds. By coming to Bethany after the death of Lazarus, the stage is set for Christ's greatest miracle. Moreover, this greater miracle will prove to be exactly what his beloved disciples need to see. All of which he says in verse 4, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And it's important to note that he mentions both his Father's glory here and his own glory as well. Remember, Jesus has claimed that he and the Father were one just a couple weeks prior to this. Here he combines the Father's glory with his own, again making himself equal to God, because God will not share his glory with another. 
Not only will this be his greatest miracle, it will also be the defining proof of his teaching that he and the Father are one. Remember when the disciples asked who had sinned, the blind man or his parents, as to why the man had been born blind, and how did Jesus answer? He answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. That was John 9, 3. And, and all of Christ's miracles are done for the glory of God, to sh- display his nature and his character to us. And all were performed uh, uh, for the reason of showing that Jesus was God. What this does not mean is that God specially struck one man with blindness, nor Lazarus with sickness. He had no reason to do that. Blindness and all manner of sickness and death are natural consequences of living in a fallen world. He could have chosen any number of people to display his power in them. But in the end, he specifically chooses those he did for his own purposes, just as the Lord chooses to save those whom he will save. He chooses to heal those whom he will heal. And in the end, no matter who he chooses, it's all for his own glory. Nevertheless, we are to note that Jesus has a plan right from the beginning. It was a plan already made in accordance with the Father, and it was a plan where every detail was measured in eternity past, and part of that plan included waiting two days and then coming into Mary and Martha's village four days after Lazarus died. Now, there's been a lot written about this four days, by the way. Uh, There was a common, though erroneous, Jewish belief that the soul of a deceased person would would linger and hover over a body for a couple of days, hovering over the dead person's body before departing. But by the fourth day, whether a person's soul went to Sheol, which is the, the Hebrew version of hell, or went to paradise, by the fourth day, long gone. Okay, By that time, everybody knew they were completely dead. The fact that Jesus deliberately comes after four days means that Lazarus was not just mostly dead, he was completely dead. And as we know from the famous words of Miracle Max, there's a big difference between mostly dead and being all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive, now all dead. Well, with all dead, there's usually only one thing you can do, go through his clothes and look for change. In Miracle Max's world, as well as the real one, Lazarus He's all dead, okay? Having been dead for four days also separates this resurrection of Lazarus from the other two resurrections performed by Jesus. Both the daughter of Jairus and the son of the widow at Nain were raised on the same day of their deaths. The one was a child, the other was a young man, probably still in his teens. And there have been documented cases even in the modern world where people proclaimed dead were actually in a swoon state. And therefore, and they wake up in their funerals. And therefore, they were only mostly dead. And some would argue that this was the case with these two young people, a son and a daughter, who should have been full of life. We don't know the age of Lazarus, but tradition has him an older man. And many believe even retired, which is why it seems that Martha and Mary were uh, uh, were running the household. Even apart from any sickness, Lazarus, as all people in his day, would have had a very short life expectancy. Now at the four days, he was in the tomb, dead and buried. And and both of these circumstances separate his resurrection as categorically different than the other two. From which we, we, uh, and again, we're specifically told that it was because Jesus loved Mary and Martha which was the reason why he delayed two days before starting out from their home. And this delay is interesting because we can also comment that God often has gracious intentions in his delay. Have we not seen this in our own lives? When God delays answers to our prayers, he is teaching us patience as well as growing our need to recognize our dependence upon him. Never make the mistake of thinking that growing in Christ that maturing in Christ makes us more independent. It's, it's just the opposite. Maturing in Christ, maturing in the faith, is a process of seeing more and more clearly just how incapable we are for any work apart from Jesus. Someone once said that mature Christians understand that no matter how bad we think we are, we're actually worse than we imagine. 
Dependence on Jesus is never a bad thing. It's always a glorious thing to know how badly we need Jesus in every way, every day. And isn't it often the case that our afflictions with the greatest amount of trouble are also those for which we receive the sweetest of mercies? Sickness, loss, disappointment are all used by God to bring him glory and as a means to strengthen the faith of his children. God answering our troubles and his glory always go hand in hand. Or at least in a Christian's mind, they should always be recognized. And sometimes God delays uh, prayer and answer to prayer because we need to deal with some sin before he gives us a blessing. But that too is just another way of teaching us dependence upon him. So let's keep reading now. Uh, back in John uh, verse 7, 11, 7. Then after this, meaning the two days, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And, and you would think by this time, the disciples would have gotten an idea that Jesus knew how to take care of himself and, and that he was always in mastery of all things. Yet their first response to Jesus saying that they should return to Judea is one of fear. And it begs the question, who, who do they think they're dealing with again? They have professed their belief that Jesus is the Son of God, but their fearful, fearful response to going back into the enemy's heartland shows otherwise. What they keep forgetting is that Jesus is uh, that Jerusalem is also Jesus' heartland, and he's the true ruler. And he goes on to remind him about the purpose for which we are being all being called. And, and back in 9, you remember we read this. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And in chapter 9, Christ was commenting on how we all have been given a purpose and work to do as long as we re remain alive in this world. And we commented that no matter what our life situation was, we could still give glory to God. Even on our deathbeds, we could still pray. We can still be a witness for Christ. Here in chapter 11, he's going to use the same night-day analogy. But now he's commenting on how the very works we are given to do by God actually keep us on the straight and narrow road and will keep us from stumbling. In other words, when we do the works of God in accordance with the Spirit, God will prevent anyone from interfering with our God-given purpose. Paul says it this way in Romans 8, 31, 39. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or, na or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God has ordained our entire lives and given us jobs that he wants us to complete that he has set out for us to do. When we set our hearts on pursuing our Lord, he allows us to prevail, whatever circumstances come. When we set our hearts on God, we can walk confidently without fear of stumbling because he will light the way. When we set our hearts on God, we can walk in confidence of not stumbling just as we would on a well-built and a well-lit road. And conversely, if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And we know the whole world is stumbling. They don't even know if they're going to get to where they think they're going. And ultimately, wherever they're trying to get to, it's going to be taken from them in the day of destruction. Let's go ahead and keep reading now. John 11, 11 to 16. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant of taking rest and sleep. 
Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. And once again, this, this calls into question, what is it that the disciples are believing? Way back in chapter 1, when, when Jesus first called his disciples, we had noted how quickly they were able to tie Old Testament scripture to Jesus. And by doing so, they were the first ones to recognize him as Messiah, as Son of God. And the Old Testament uses sleep as a metaphor for death some 54 times. And, and it's an excellent metaphor for death for believers because it denotes how believers will transition from one life into the next. We fall asleep to our old life, our old bodies, and we're wakened up by the glory of God to begin a new life in Christ. Had they been thinking about the glory of God and not their own skin, one wonders if they would not have made the connection as Jesus intended. In either case, Jesus clarifies, and he plainly tells them, Lazarus has now died. Again, we presume he has uh, a divine knowledge of this, which prompts this strange response from Thomas about going to die with Lazarus. And the only thing we know about Thomas is that after the resurrection, he wasn't with the other disciples when Jesus first appears. And upon hearing the news just from the other disciples, he refuses to believe, and, and of course, since then, We've forever known him as Doubting Thomas because he can't believe this report. It seems that he was one of these ones who needed to have a first-hand uh, verification or nothing else would do. Now, it's not entirely clear what Thomas is thinking here. Given, however, the fear being expressed by these disciples upon thinking about returning to Judea, it's possible Thomas had begun to doubt if any of them were going to escape alive at this point. In essence, he thinks they're basically defeated, just as all of them think at the crucifixion. All of them think they're defeated at that point. But to Thomas's credit, he's still willing to give it all up for Jesus now, or, or so he says, because let's not forget Peter's confession that he was willing to follow him to death. If so, then this is yet another point of irony in John's gospel, because in one sense, in Thomas's doubt and fear, he actually gets it right. For anyone who is in Christ dies in Christ at the cross. And what Thomas, along with all the others, still didn't understand or even begin to imagine, that dying in Christ is necessary precursor to being raised in Christ. But note how Thomas's dour response is contrasted to Jesus, who is rejoicing for the sake of his disciples. For your sake, I am glad I was not there. And why is Jesus glad? Because he knows upon their seeing the miracle he's about to perform, it will help them believe all the more. Which is precisely what Thomas and all the rest of them need very, very much at this point. Continue, John eleven seventeen. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now still I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Now, from Luke's account of Mary and Martha, we learn that Martha had allowed herself to become unnecessarily burdened with the running of the home. And the nature of her character is once again revealed here. As Martha is the one, she gets up and rushes off to meet Jesus. And in contrast to Mary, who's apparently content to sit and wait for Jesus to come to her. We've just mentioned that the disciples whom Jesus first called were well-schooled in the scripture, and this, it appears to be no less true for Martha. In her greeting to Jesus, she reflects at least three truths that she understood. 
One, she understands that there will be a last day, referring to the great climactic judging of all people before the throne of God. Two, she understands that there will be a future resurrection of all the dead. And that, by the way, is no small thing because that was not even wholly accepted by all the Jews. There was a whole faction of Judaism that didn't believe there was going to be a resurrection. And while Jesus will utterly refute the false teaching that there would be no resurrection, he actually doesn't do that until after the triumphal procession, which is coming in a couple of weeks. Third, she recognizes that Jesus has the power to change the crippling effects of illness with an implicit understanding that he is God. And, and in Jesus' response, he actually interacts with all of these points. And he begins with this marvelous promise, your brother will rise again. And it's a great promise that can and does bring comfort to those of us knowing we'll see our loved ones again. But if you just lost a loved one, it's probably not the very first thing you want to hear out of the mouth of somebody uh, that you're waiting to bring comfort and hope from, right? Is to, to give some theological truth. And I could tell you, uh, and from firsthand knowledge, that when you lose somebody, well, at least you'll see them in heaven is the last thing you want to hear. It's not comforting. It's actually incredibly insensitive and borders on the crass. Scripture tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, and to be sure, there's a place afterwards to discuss life, the meaning of life and death. But in general, general we want to save theology for another hour, if not for another day. Now, now, of course, Jesus was not being insensitive at all, nor was he speaking about a theological question. He was actually preparing her for what he was about to do. And it's not hard, though, to hear the probable disappointment in her answer when she replies, Yes, Lord, I know he will rise again on the great day of resurrection, but, but that's, that's somewhere in the future. What about now? What is, what is really on her heart is what she said at the beginning. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's what she's thinking. That's what's in her heart. She even intimates she's expecting, has been expecting more from Jesus. That's why she follows up with, even now I still know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And some think she's moving ahead and actually asking Jesus to resurrect Lazarus. But, but her reaction in just a short time in front of the tomb with Jesus makes such a view doubtful. At the tomb with Jesus, what does she do there? Instead of expecting a miracle, what is she concerned with? We're going to see she's concerned with the odor from the rot of death should the stone be rolled away. And that doesn't speak of someone who believes that Jesus is going to raise her brother from the dead. It does, however, speak of someone who's still very confused about what's going on. And why would Jesus come and say these things? And what is most probable, she was saying something to this effect. She's affirming that even though she is very disappointed and her brother died, she still believes Jesus could have prevented his death from happening. She was affirming, even in her disappointment, that Jesus had not arrived on time. She was still affirming she's not going to disown Jesus. But do you know what? The reality is Jesus never had to be there to begin with, did he? Upon hearing about Lazarus' illness, he simply could have healed him by the power of his will as his time. That's what he does in Luke's gospel with the centurion's servant. He didn't need to physically be there in the presence of Lazarus to effect his healing. Which brings us to what Lazarus' death and resurrection was really all about. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the resurrection of the life. That is what is going on here. Jesus has been teaching all along how any who believe in him, how any who put their faith in him, how any who would follow his voice would not see death. They would not see death because they are going to be given eternal life. And raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus is pointing directly to the power invested in him to accomplish everything he has been saying from the beginning. 
by restoring physical life in Lazarus, he proves his claim. Just as he was able to give physical life by extension, he is able to give eternal life. And, and we've seen Jesus arguing in this exact same way before, from, from uh, when some friends brought a paralytic man before Jesus. Do you remember that? Other gospel? He said a curious thing. Instead of healing the man, he says to them, Man, your sins are forgiven. Luke 5.20. And then we read this. This is Luke 5.20-21. 20 to 21, 21 to 25. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question uh, in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise and walk? And it's a great question, because anybody can throw words around, right? I won the lottery. Okay, well, let's see your ticket. Oh, I don't, I don't have that, right? But the proof is in the pudding. A person is known by their deeds, not just their words. If their words and their deeds do not match up, you know you have a phony on your hands. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. In doing so, Jesus proved he had the authority to forgive sin because miraculous action spoke louder than his words. Who can forgive sin? Well, if anyone can, it would not be a bad place to start with the guy who works miracles. The Jews had been ready to stone Jesus on several occasions because of his claim to be equal to God. And they had accused him of blasphemy as well. With the resurrection of Lazarus, he is about to do what he did with the paralytic. He doesn't use these exact words, but he could have said, just like he said to the paralytic, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to give eternal life. He said to the man who was dead, Lazarus, come out. Take off your grave clothes and go home. And that's what Jesus is doing with Lazarus. He will be giving life and forced to his claim that he is truly the resurrection and the life. He begins by saying the words, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he will end by raising Lazarus from the dead. For now, Jesus needs to remind Martha, as well as the other disciples, once again, of just who he is. And when, as a way of reminder, he asks her if she believes, she remembers that which she's already confessed. She had come questioning her Lord, and even though her questioning was in no way meant as a kind of affront to Jesus, her questioning needed to be challenged. And by the grace of God, when challenged, she wonderfully responds in the fully appropriate manner, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Martha wanted to see her brother alive. That is what she thought she needed most. But Jesus, coming in grace and truth, sees what she first needed was further instruction. He's yet going to show his grace. Right? But it was more important for the faith of this woman whom he loved to be first reminded about the truth. The truth is, Jesus is full of life. The truth is, Jesus is life. And if we think about it, it's a very appropriate place and time to perform this upcoming miracle as well. Jesus is going to be crucified in just a couple months. This miracle is going to prepare his disciples for his own death and departure. This miracle will give them one more amazing proof and another incredible assurance to lead his own beloved disciples to where they need to go. The place, just a stone's throw from Jerusalem, is very strategic. Not only is it in close proximity to Jerusalem, Bethlehem is also along the major roadway from Jericho to Jerusalem, a road which was heavily traveled in Jesus' day. News is going to spread up and down very quickly. There's many Jews from Jerusalem there to console the sisters, so a large contingent of witnesses are already at hand. Everything is set for the greatest of Jesus' miracles. Everything is set to prove that Jesus is the resurrection, and the life. 
And consequently, everything is set to verify the words of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And the application, exactly the same as it was last week. And the same which Jesus posed to Martha. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Let's close in prayer. Lord, you are king. You are Lord over all the universe. You are Lord over all creation. You speak. You bring things into existence out of nothing. You split the waters with a word. You bring sight to blind eyes, strength to dead limbs. And Lord, you speak life into dead bodies. You're just as gracious not more amazing. You speak life into dead souls. You have proven yourself over and over. You have proven your love. You have shown who you are. Lord, help us to believe. Help our unbelief. In your holy and blessed name we pray.